Welcome to the ICMR Online Prescribing Skills Course 2020 for the Indian Medical Graduate. I am Dr. Pooja Gupta and today we are going to revise fundamentals of prescribing which were covered at length in pharmacology. After viewing this video, please answer 5 MCQs given in the assignment section and leave a feedback. At the outset, it is important to remember that prescribing is not just about writing the name of a medicine on a piece of paper, it's the amalgamation of sound medical knowledge and its translation for the benefit of the patient. Fundamentals of prescribing form the cornerstone on which the therapeutic management of a patient evolves. Knowing them will help you prescribe rationally, which in turn will reduce medication errors, improve treatment outcomes, reduce drug-related morbidity and mortality, and reduce overall healthcare costs, all of which directly or indirectly improve doctor-patient relationship. The MCI recommendations define seven competencies related to the fundamentals of prescribing, of which the three most common ones will be covered in this module. At the end of the module, you should be able to explain the stages of good prescribing, state the criteria for selection of a drug and its regime, demonstrate the application of these principles while prescribing for a condition, enumerate types of prescription, point out the critical aspects of any given prescription stating its legal and ethical importance, state importance of prescription and responsibility of prescription writing, state common errors that occur while prescribing, explain the measures to be taken to avoid common errors, state the guidelines for record keeping, mentioning the reasons. Good prescribing practices involve four stages of prescribing, gathering information for the correct diagnosis, decision making for treatment selection for which you have to define patient's problem, specify therapeutic objective, consider for non-pharmacological management, make a list of group of effective drugs, choose an appropriate drug from selected group and choose appropriate dosing regime, then communicating to the patient and finally monitoring, review and referral. Now let's discuss a common case scenario to better understand these stages. A 38-year-old gentleman Ramesh Babu, resident of Janta Flats, New Delhi, shopkeeper by occupation, presents to you with complaints of weight gain for last six months. He follows a sedentary and unhealthy lifestyle, which includes junk food and smoking. His father was suffering from hypertension and died of heart attack at the age of 55. On examination, his BP was 128.78 and BMI was 27. Other findings were within normal limits. His fasting blood glucose was 109, total cholesterol 342, LDL 201, triglycerides 218, and HDL was 37 mg per deciliter. Now that we have the relevant information, it should be briefly mentioned on the prescription card. This includes important patient particulars like his name, age and gender, and then hospital identification number, especially if the hospital follows a software-based documentation system. Also write down the chief presenting complaints and relevant history, including medication history where required. Like for in this case, apart from the chief complaints of weight gain, smoking habit, sedentary lifestyle, and death of his father from cardiovascular diseases are relevant. Then make a mention of the important findings of clinical examination, like blood pressure, weight or BMI of the patient. Also mention the relevant investigations like normal blood sugar and deranged lipid profile. At some times, investigations may not be required. In the first visit itself, you may directly prescribe for the ailment based on the history and examination, for example, for common cold. Once we have the information, we define patient's problem, which is weight gain and dyslipidemia. For this patient, the therapeutic objective would be to reduce weight, normalize lipid levels, and ultimately prevent cardiovascular complications. Now that we know our therapeutic objective, we must choose an appropriate treatment. We have several classes of antihyperlipidemic drugs from which we will select the most appropriate group based on efficacy, safety, suitability and cost. From pharmacology knowledge, you would recollect that statins reduce LDL cholesterol by up to 65%. Then comes the bile acid sequestrants and gugu lipids followed by fibrates, niacin and ezetimib. For triglyceride lowering, fibrates and niacin are most efficacious with 20-50% to 50 TG reduction. Then comes statins, other groups are much less efficacious and some may even increase their levels. Niacin is most efficacious to increase HDL but it is only marginally reduced in our patient. Gugulipid and statins are generally better tolerated than other agents. All the classes of drugs are administered orally and long-acting statins, few fibrates and ezetimib may be administered once daily which is suitable for long-term compliance. Other agents require twice or thrice daily dosing. 
In terms of price, statins and niacin are much cheaper than the others. Taking all of this together, statins is an obvious group of choice. Once we have selected the group, we have to identify the most appropriate drug for this patient and these are some of the commonly available statins. Atorvastatin and rosuvastatin lower LDL cholesterol by up to 65% but others range between 20 and 50%. Atorva, rosuva and simvastatin lower triglycerides by up to 30%. HDL increasing efficacy of rosuva and simvastatin is more than that of the other agents. All the drugs in this class have almost similar safety profile. But suitability wise, atorvastatin and rosuvastatin have an extra edge as they require once daily dosing which can be given at any time of the day. Currently, atorvastatin is the cheapest drug available, costing around 7 to 10 rupees per 10 tablets for commonly available brands. Here, you have to understand that efficacy and safety data of individual statins is relative and dose dependent. Even the standard textbooks differ in this. Even the costs may change with time. And as a medical graduate, you should stay up to date and cautiously interpret such data whenever it is presented to you. With the current knowledge, Atorvastatin may be preferred for this patient because of the lower cost. But mind you, if the patient was not at high risk or he presented for the first time, we could have prescribed him lifestyle modifications only. This means that prescribing a medicine is not always necessary and not prescribing any medicine at relevant times is also a part of rational prescribing. For Atorvastatin, the usual starting dose is 10 mg orally and with a plasma half-life of more than 14 hours, once daily dosing is sufficient and can be taken at any time of the day. Absorption is enhanced by food, so it is better to prescribe the medicine after meals. Communication is an essential but often neglected part of prescribing. Details of communication skills are covered in another module. As part of good prescribing practices, write instructions for the patient, preferably in vernacular language for better understanding. Apart from this, you must explain to the patient about the disease, the drug and mode of drug administration in a comprehensible language. For example, tell Mr. Ramesh that lifestyle modifications like moderate aerobic exercise, stopping smoking and healthy eating habits are also important to prevent long-term cardiovascular complications. This step is important for patient management, that is to know whether the treatment is working or the drug is producing some adverse effects or needs dose modification or change of therapy. Like in our case, repeat investigations have to be prescribed to assess the effect of treatment. Also, you may have to refer your patient for a condition that cannot be managed in your settings or requires a specialist, for example, statin-induced myopathy. Remember that prescription is a medico-legal document and is not valid without your signature. If you are working in a government hospital, your signature should also be accompanied by your name. A rational prescription should look like this. It's legibly written with all the fields entered, including the date, prescriber and patient details, appropriate medical history, medicines prescribed by generic names and in capital letters, instructions written in vernacular language, follow-up directions, and your signature with name in the end. It's now possible to prescribe electronically also, and here is a sample format. When and where available, e-prescription may overcome problems arising from poor handwriting, it can identify potential drug-drug interactions, inappropriate formulations, etc. It improves the flow of information between prescriber and pharmacy and also helps in paperless maintenance of records. Now let's look at a prescription written by some other physician for our Mr. Ramesh Babu. Try to analyze it on your own and you will notice that the date is not mentioned which may create difficulties during follow-up or drug dispensing. It is also important for medical legal issues. It is mandatory for a private practitioner to mention qualification and registration number on the prescription. This could be a legal issue because the practitioner should be registered in the state medical register where he is prescribing. As I mentioned earlier, the age and gender may guide us in approaching the diagnosis and deciding the treatment. Proper history is to be documented but only the treatment is written here. Without these, it may be more difficult for you to recall the same on a follow-up visit. Can you read the medicines written here with confidence? For example, is the first drug Rorab or Rabiprazol or Rast or Rosuvastatin or Ronal Reloxifen? The second drug is hardly readable but could be Fenlip which is a phenofibrate. The third could be a multivitamin b -koshal, and fourth may be pantoprazole domperidone fixed dose combination. Notice that none of the medicine has been prescribed by its generic name 
and phenofibrate has been prescribed with a statin which may increase the risk of myopathy. Vitamins and PPIs only add to the cost of the treatment. For dosing frequency, abbreviation has to be used that seems to be OD but may be misleading. No instructions have been given to the patient who may continue taking all the prescribed medicines indefinitely. Also, we do not know if lifestyle modifications were informed to the patient. There are no instructions to the pharmacist regarding the amount of drug that is to be dispensed. There is no signature to validate the prescription and then it even says not valid for medical legal purposes in a very small font. By writing this, you as a physician cannot shrug away from your responsibility. Let us revisit a few things that a prescriber must follow while prescribing like writing a diagnosis which could be provisional, differential or definitive, writing legibly, mentioning the date, mentioning your details including qualification, registration number and contact number and if you are practicing in a hospital then your name with the signature. Then patient details especially age, gender and relevant history. As far as possible you should prescribe the medicines by their generic names and in capital letters. Preferably first write the oral medicines followed by injectables and then topicals for ease of adherence. Mention the formulation of the drug and instructions in a simple language along with the total duration of the treatment. When the drug dose is in decimals, always write 0 before the decimal point and keep space between the dose and the unit to avoid medication errors. Specify dosage of drugs prescribed on as required basis like the time gap between two doses and the maximum dose that can be taken in 24 hours to prevent toxicity. On the other hand, avoid using brand names and abbreviations, never use trailing zeros following the decimal point, don't prescribe unnecessary drugs as rewards like multivitamins, don't leave much space between prescribed medicines or instructions and the signature to avoid misuse. MCI gives a list of practices that are considered unethical regarding prescribing. For example, you should not engage in promotional slogans which imply that there will be no payment if the disease is not cured. Neither exaggerate nor minimize the condition of the patient. Don't prescribe secret medicines that don't display their ingredients. Use lab investigations judiciously and not in a routinely manner. Don't withdraw treatment without adequate prior notice. The last part of prescribing is record keeping as it is said that not documented means not done. Records are required to be maintained for reviewing and monitoring the patient's response at follow up to take further medical decisions and sometimes for audit trail in medico legal cases. According to MCI, an IMG shall maintain inpatient records for at least 3 years from commencement of the treatment and provide the same within 72 hours when asked for. Details of record keeping are discussed in another module. Hippocratic oath is to work for the benefit of the patient. You should try not to indulge in any act that can cause harm to the patient or the community, either directly or indirectly. So stay up to date in knowledge, write completely and legibly and practice rational use of medicines. This is an alphabetical list of some suggestions for further reading. I acknowledge the support and contribution of my co-investigators and IUMC committee members and especially thank Dr. Sharik for his help with the artwork. Thank you for watching this video. Hope you are now ready to attempt the MCQs given in the assignment section and submit your answers. Please also complete the prescription evaluation as per the tutorial. Happy learning and hopefully you will prescribe rationally. Thank you.